Second, Benedictine spirituality is a liturgical spirituality centered in the Opus Dei, the work of God. The center or ongoing source of Benedictine spirituality is located in what Benedict calls the Opus Dei, that is, the work of God by which he means that cycle of daily prayer we call the Liturgy of the Hours or the Divine Office. If at an earlier stage in the evolution of monasticism, Opus Dei meant the monastic life in its entirety, the fact that in Benedict this term takes on a specific liturgical character is significant. It means that the grounding or center of all those values I just presented is to be located in the liturgy itself, the celebration of Christ's multiple and real presences among us. The core context then is the liturgy. There should really be no distinction between liturgy and life. The hours are not about the sanctification of time, about making certain moments holy throughout the day, but the hours are about making all of life holy, for all of liturgy, including the hours, is about the sanctification of people. The values of the rule of St. Benedict, then, are the expression of that communal life in a liturgical form, says Benedict. We believe that the divine presence is everywhere, but beyond the least doubt, we should believe this to be especially true when we celebrate the divine office. If Christ is the absolute center of Benedict's rule, then the opus dei, the work of God, the liturgy of the hours, is at the center of those who would live according to that rule, as Abbot Patrick Regan has written. Benedict urges us to prefer nothing to the love of Christ, but since Christ is especially present at the office, he can likewise declare that we should prefer nothing to this work of God. It is the relationship with Christ which grounds community, provides stability and balance, and forms hospitality. And in Benedictine life, this centeredness in Christ is focused especially in the daily recitation of the office. Now the content of that prayer encountered in the Liturgy of the Hours, or office, is precisely the systematic arrangement of psalmody, hymns, and the organized reading of scripture. And if the divine office is rightly an ancient tradition of prayer for the whole church, it is in part Benedictines and other religious communities which have kept it alive over the centuries so that others might again embrace it today. And further, it's important to note this, as Benedict interprets the office, it is not some lower class of worship. It is, as noted, precisely where the Christ who is everywhere is present and encountered in that life. But why so much emphasis on the Psalms? Certainly the ancient office of the church, at least outside of monasteries, was more focused on popular hymns, select scripture readings and praise, and intercession in, in general. But the Benedictine office is centered in the Psalms. My friend, Sister Irene Noel of the Order of St. Benedict is at, at Mount St. Scholastica in Atchison, Kansas, describes it this way. She writes, the book of Psalms is a collection of prayers composed and kept by the believing community of ancient Israel. The fact that they are still kept by Jews and Christians alike is testimony to our common belief that God still speaks to us through these prayers. In the Psalms, there is a powerful joining of God's word to us and our word to God. We read them as God's word to us. We take the gift of that word, fill it with our own life's experience, and return it to God. For Christians, there is the added insight that the Psalms were the prayer of Jesus. He still prays them in and with us today. Similarly, the great Thomas Merton from Gethsemane Abbey in Louisville, Kentucky once wrote, The Psalms are not only the revealed word of God, not only the words which God himself has indicated to be those which he likes to hear. 
The Psalms are not only the songs of prophets inspired by God, they are songs of the whole church, the very expression of her deepest inner life. The words and thoughts of the Psalms spring not only from the unsearchable depths of God, but also from the innermost heart of the church. And there are no songs which better express her soul, her desires, her longing, her sorrows, and her joys. The reason why the church loves the Psalms is not merely that they have been sent to her by God, but because God has given himself to her in them. The church loves to sing over and over again the songs of the old psalmists because in them she is singing of her knowledge of God, of her union with God. To put it plainly, the church loves the psalms because in them she sings of her experience of God, of her union with the incarnate word, of her contemplation of God in the mystery of Christ. And in his classic work on Christian community, Life Together, Lutheran theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer once said, The Psalter is the prayer book of Jesus Christ in the truest sense of the word. He prayed the Psalter, and now it has become his prayer for all time. The Psalter is the prayer of Christ for his church. Now that Christ is with the Father, the new humanity of Christ, the body of Christ on earth, continues to pray his prayer to the end of time. The prayer belongs not just to the individual member, but to the whole body of Christ. Only in the whole Christ does the whole Psalter become a reality, a whole which the individual can never fully comprehend and call his own. That is why the prayer of the Psalms belongs in a peculiar way to the fellowship. Even if a verse or a psalm is not one's prayer, it is nevertheless the prayer of another member of the fellowship. So it is quite certainly the prayer of Jesus Christ and his body on earth. In the Psalter, we learn to pray on the basis of Christ's prayer. The Psalter is the great school of prayer. There are today, of course, several resources available for assistance in learning the Liturgy of the Hours or the Divine Office, including, of course, the Church's four-volume Liturgy of the Hours itself, or those one-volume editions known as Christian Prayer. But for those seeking especially a Benedictine model, there are several others. The traditional monastic diurnal, containing the day hours of the traditional monastic office, both in Latin and English, has recently been reprinted, though my edition is not a recent one at all. More simply, Sister Judith Sutera's beautiful Work of God provides a two-week cycle of morning and evening prayer, including Compline or bedtime prayer, with psalms, scripture readings, and other texts. This could easily be adapted to family prayer, perhaps especially in the evening or before bedtime. St. Meinrad's Arch Abbey in southern Indiana has made available, <clears throat> excuse me, a lovely edition of their monastic office called the Liturgy of the Hours for Benedictine Oblates, complete even with musical notation for the psalms. This edition provides not only for morning and evening prayer in Compline, organized on a four-week cycle for the Psalms, but also includes midday prayer. I would be remiss, of course, if I did not mention here the edition of the monastic office that I compiled and edited with monks at St. John's Abbey called Benedictine Daily Prayer, a short breviary, which seeks to take the traditional Benedictine office, complete with all seven of what is called the canonical hours, and offer a simplified version of it with a choice of either a one-week or two-week cycle. I designed this for those who might want a more complete edition of the office, with two longer biblical readings each day in the office called vigils, or readings, than other available versions might have. I want to highlight another recent resource for daily prayer published by the Liturgical Press in Minnesota, namely the monthly resource called Give Us This Day. In addition to all the texts and the prayers for the Eucharistic liturgy for Sundays and weekdays, 
Give Us This Day provides a simplified morning and evening prayer for each day that would be easily adaptable for family prayer. The structure therein is of one psalm, short scripture reading, the canticle of Zechariah or Benedictus in the morning, and the canticle of Mary or Magnificat in the evening, followed by models for intercession. This provides a very workable office for daily use. Any or all of these resources can be of great assistance as we seek to follow Benedict's charge to prefer nothing to the Opus Dei, nothing to the work of God. Now, closely related to the prayer of the hours, Benedict also places emphasis in his rule on the place where such prayer happens, namely what is called the oratory in the monastery or the abbey church. And of course, the monastery church is central to Benedictine life in general. But as a sacred space in our homes for prayer, the presence of an oratory, a place, can be very conducive and helpful. It does not need to be elaborate, though it certainly could be like the room of the cross in some Eastern Orthodox homes filled with icons, candles, and incense. But a favorite icon, statue, or cross, a candle, Bible, or whatever, it need not be large and it need not contain much. Something to designate to you and to others in your family that this is an undisturbed place for prayer, a place to seek and to meet God through prayer.